All right, somebody define for me, since we're talking about perseverance, somebody define for me what perseverance is. Larry is ready to go. Okay, Larry. The definition that I found was continue, continued effort to achieve something despite difficulties, failure, or opposition. Okay. And another word for that was steadfastness. Okay. Did you copy my paper? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. That's the same definition I got. Uh, and I think that's a, that's a good definition. Anybody else have something that they came up with uh, that you would define perseverance as? Yeah, Lewis. Keep on keeping on. Keep on keeping on. Okay. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. That's what it is. I, I like what Larry said because that's what I had. But um, continued effort to do or achieve something despite difficulties, failure, or opposition. You know, we, we see something that we're look, trying to do, we want to accomplish, and, and there's that battle that we're going to, you know, we're going to run into a roadblock somewhere along the way, right? Something that's going to cause us difficulty, failure, opposition, it's going to make it dif hard, difficult for us to do and or accomplish. Tara, Tara's got one. Um, keep on going up to heaven. Okay. Keep on going. That's not, that's the process, right? And heaven's our destination. That's our goal. So that's where we're trying to get to. That's what we as Christians are trying to do, to keep on keeping on, keep fighting the battle in order to reach our goal of heaven. And as Larry mentioned, some other words that you can look at some scriptures that are similar in, in uh, context here, and you can see some other Bible words that I pulled out were steadfastness, endurance, patience, uh, it, some of those words, when you look at their definition, it kind of goes a little farther into things like being persistent, to bear, uh, maybe a heavy load or a struggle, fortitude. Uh, it could even be, uh, when you talk about steadfastness, steadfastness, uh, something established. So let's say you've gotten yourself started on something and you're fixed toward that goal. You've established your method and what you have in place to stay on that, to be stable in what you're trying to do. Robert, I think you had a comment. You mentioned patience. Uh, the word that comes from, it, it, it deals with, we have patience with each other. Mm -hmm. We don't endure each other. Or maybe we do, but, but endurance, what you're talking about, is with circumstances. Now, it could be from people, but mm -hmm. just very trying circumstances in life that we have to endure. Mm -hmm. that we have to be patient with each other. Mm -hmm. There's a little difference. Yeah, I mean, uh, part of, the, of an opposition sometimes to what we want to accomplish can be other people. Uh, so we have to be patient, patient with one another, patient with the process, um, you know, trying to get to the, to the goal. Um, give me an example of something that you have experience that has required perseverance, um, you know, what steps did you take to persevere through that to accomplish your goal or something? We all have things, so give me an example. Joe's got one. Paramedic school. Paramedic school. Why, what was something about that that you had to persevere toward? Studying, skills tests. Yeah. Yeah, took study. two years. Yeah, anybody, any of us that's been in school or, or college or whatever, trying to accomplish something like becoming a, a paramedic or anything like that, it takes perseverance to sometimes force ourselves to stay on track, right? To to study. You know, sometimes, you know, studying is not our favorite thing to do. You know, and we have to stay on track to do that. Anybody else has something that that they would like to share? You know, okay, Caleb. Anytime you start a new job, I was like, you don't know anything, so you're going to have to learn the ropes per se. Um, nobody's going to be great at everything when they first start out. So absolutely, it takes time to to start a job. I I'll give you my own personal experience related to what Caleb was saying. We we started our uh, new operation down in Fishers and in, in uh, beginning of 2015. And that was a challenge. The, a new plant startup is not easy to do. You're bringing in new processes, new equipment, new people, everything involved with that. You're, you're spending months 
maybe years ahead trying to prep for this and plan for this, whatever kind of equipment that you want to buy, how you want to set the process up, how you expect it to go. And you go through this whole thing, and as Caitlin mentioned, it's new. Uh, you picture in your mind what you think will happen and how it will, how it will run, but then you find there are problems along the way. Things don't go as planned. Something you expected or, uh, to happen or what you envisioned happening doesn't happen the way you envision it. Then you have to find ways to get around it. You spend a lot of hours, a lot of energy trying to get it to a certain point. You have to stay on track. You can't just walk away from that. You have to keep pushing, keep uh, trying to reach the goal and get to where you want. Uh, you may, then you have people who might come in and look at it and say, and question things. Why did you do what you did? It doesn't make sense, or I don't understand why you made that choice to do this. So you're gonna get those type of things as well. You have to keep pushing through that, and eventually we, we, we got to where we wanted to be. Um, but you know, it was the, one of the more challenging times in my career, but yet at the same time, one of the more rewarding times when you can get through that. And we can look at that in life uh, when we do go things that we have to persevere through. Um, when we come, go back and look at it, a lot of times we'll say, hey, I really feel, you know, proud of that. And uh, you f it's rewarding. And, and just like trying to serve God, you know, we can go through difficulties, but we know that the reward is good and we stay toward that goal. Um, okay, Robert. Each one of us has our own internal definition of that. Thank you. Um, what might be hard for me or difficult for me to persevere through might be simple for you mm -hmm. or you know the same with any one of us when we look at biblical definitions and, and look at examples of that in in the bible when jesus says pick up your cross and follow me we know that that's a death sentence we know that you know you die when you get on the cross when we see the example of jesus bearing the cross he was already near death when he tried to carry it so it's much more for him to persevere than for us and each time we overcome one of these obstacles, the next one will be maybe a little more difficult, but we'll still have to persevere to get through that. Mm -hmm. And that kind of goes back to, to Robert's comment, too, about being patient with one another. You know, when we try, one of the things we'll talk about is trying how we, what are things that can help us persevere? And we'll talk about that. One of, a, one of those things is each other. You know, we can, we can help each other or we can hinder each other but we need to be patient through that process and, and help one another. That's one of the big things. So yeah, we all, you know, we have to be understanding of that with one another that what may be easy for you to persevere through may be a difficulty for somebody else. Um, so I wanna go through our next question here. So let's, let's look at that. What are some reasons that can cause us uh, to have a lack of perseverance? You know, and especially if we wanna look at it in a spiritual sense. What are things that make us struggle to persevere and to endure and to be strong? Carrie? Uh, taking our eye off the goal, mm -hmm. worldly influence, and sometimes ingratitude for the things that we've been given. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's an easy one to, to lose track of. We can become complainers and forget the blessings that we do have. I see, I think it was John, okay. For me, anything that I try to accomplish, I have to stay somewhat single-minded or at least totally focused on the end goal. Mm -hmm. If I let something get between me and that focus, then I've got one more thing I've got to overcome. Right. So having that, that searing focus on the end goal, I think is... Right. What, what, what's everybody always talk about at the beginning of the year, you know, or talking about New Year's resolutions and how that often falls flat a lot of times. You know, we can look at reasons for that and it falls right into this, I guess, same type of thing. Jessica. Um, also, I think as far as like what could be something that would cause us lack of perseverance spiritually would be not um, not really knowing the word enough, not knowing God enough, a lack of faith and patience. Um, because if if you don't know the word and see what God has brought others through and see how God is faithful and you don't have that strong faith in him, 
then you don't have a hope to keep pushing forward. Right. We haven't built, we're not, haven't built or are actively trying to build those type of things to get where we need to get it, get us that help. Uh, Melissa and then uh, Lauren. Feeling alone can mm -hmm. make it really hard to keep going, mm -hmm. which is why God gave us the church, gave us each other. But even introverted people need other people. Like we're just built, we're designed to need that support and camaraderie. But when you feel alone, it's easier to get tired and just want to give up. Absolutely. And that's, again, we just, that's, that's a common thing I'm seeing with all of that everybody feels and, and, and is saying something is the, the part that we need each other to do it. We cannot do that by ourselves, Lauren. Along with that idea of having no support system is also if you have the wrong support system. If you, as a Christian, if you decide to surround yourself with people that aren't, uh, that don't love God, that that's not their center focus, that's not going to help you persevere in the direction you want to go. Right. It's, it's easy to get influenced by those things. Uh, absolutely. Um, one other thing I want to throw out there is, is what is our treasure? You know, what does the Bible tell us about our treasure in our hearts? You know, whatever we value, that's what we're, our heart's going to be focused on, isn't it? So if we are not focused on the importance of our spiritual life, then we're going to lose focus on persevering. It's going to be easy to throw that away, just like the parable of the sower and the different situations that are illustrated in that, that people struggle to stay on track with. Uh, people can give up at the first sign of trouble. Um, and so, yeah, we, we need to have faith. We need to have that as our treasure, our importance, and the goal that we're trying to reach. You know, not everybody has the same amount of fortitude. You know, we look at the character of all of us. We're all different in character. Some of us can be really strong when it comes to fortitude and trying to accomplish something. Some of us can be easily swayed, easily lose that focus and give up. So that's, again, about comes back to where we need to recognize that of each other and figure out how to help one another and build one another up. That's the purpose of this church family that we have. Lewis. Hebrews 12, 3, consider him who endures, endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. God disciplines his children. Mm -hmm. He's telling us that perseverance will be part of your life. And God uses it as a, as a source of uh, discipline. And so we need to not take it for granted mm -hmm. and keep on overcoming it. Stay steadfast as was said earlier about the goal we have because it's a source of discipline. Yeah. Well, sometimes that discipline helps keep us on the goal, right? Whether we think of it that way or not, because discipline is going to bring us back to, on track where we need to be, right? If we aren't disciplined, and, or whether it's somebody encourage us to, to put something away that we don't need in our lives or make some corrections, or help get us refocused, you know, we're going to lose the desire to persevere, right? And some, that's, again, another reason why we need each other, to get us back on the right track. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to skip on down. I want to look, because I, some of these questions are very similar, questions three through five really are very similar. Um, but let's, let's look at some things in question five. What are some things that are necessary to have uh, to have in place to help us persevere spiritually. What do we need to be doing, Joe? Faith. Faith, okay. So how are we going to get that faith? Faith by what? By hearing, hearing by the Word of God. All those three t things tied together. We can't just drop the spiritual aspect of our lives. We can't just set that aside and do nothing with it and come here once a week or something like that, and and we do nothing in in, in between because... The battle's out the, outside the door. It's not in here. So we have to be able to stay strong while we're out in the middle of the battlefield, so to speak. We can't let that get away from us in our lives. We've got to keep our faith. We, got, we have to keep ourselves in the Word. What else? Anything else? that Debbie? Yeah, we've got to keep our conversation going with God, right, in a way. 
Absolutely. Any, anything else? Okay, I, we, gotta, we, we need to also make sure that we keep focus on the right source for our strength. You know, there's so many options that are thrown our way out there trying to tell us how to, to live our lives. But as Christians, we have to stay focused on the true source, and that being God, that being His Word, that being our, uh, our Savior, Jesus Christ. We've got to follow His Word and His example. And we have to know what He's asking us to do. Robert and then Kyle. In Romans 12, it tells us to be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then Paul gives us a long laundry list of things we can do as a Christian, that as we do them, we do them with a sense of putting God first in our lives, with a sense of excellence, do it with all of our power. This is an exercise in faith, in complementary to what uh, James says about, show me your faith without your actions, or I'll show you my faith by my actions. Mm -hmm. That doing the will of God, will increase your faith, yeah. living it. Yeah, it's be not, you know, not nearly just saying and, and expressing our belief, but showing it by our actions and by our things that we do. Kyle? Well, Robert alluded to it in his last statement that not only do we have to have faith, but we have to have action in our, we have to be able, we have to believe and obey what God and, and our Savior tell us to do mm -hmm. and because it says in uh in hebrews 3 not uh 19 or 18 and 19 it says and to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest but those who were disobedient so we see that we are unable to enter because of our unbelief yeah. so there's two different words there that are close to having the same meaning but we got to we've got to be obedient to his word and to believe right. his truth of what he says. Yeah, we have to put it into practice in our lives. We have to be actively doing that to build up our strength, don't we? Um, I want to look at question six. So it says in verses one through six, who was a source of strength to the Jews? Let's go to, we're going to go to the scriptures now. Who was a source of strength to the Jews and who does the Hebrew writer suggest is a better source? So let's, uh, if somebody would volunteer to read the first six verses of chapter three, and we'll uh, analyze that section real quick. Who would like to read that? Brock, do you have it? Since you have the mic? Okay, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yes. <clears throat> Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, Consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who is faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. Okay, so now as we go back into the scriptures, we want to keep in mind the context of the idea that we have Jewish Christians who are ready to turn away from following Jesus and following the things that they had been taught in the New Covenant. And they were struggling. They were struggling because of the persecution, the things around them, and their perseverance wasn't very strong, was it? They were ready to walk away and go back to the old law and the old ways of doing things. And the Hebrew writer is trying to get them to, to really see. Uh, we've been talking about the idea that they may have focused on angels and the prophets and the things that they were, they were going back and locking on to what was said then and somehow giving up on what they had been taught now, uh, the, the new way of doing things, I guess you could say. And so now we're going to see who was uh, listed here as someone that they found a source of strength, someone that they, they looked highly upon that, that was a source of strength to them. Moses. Moses. We see Moses as one who they, they often go to uh, on all that, that he led and happened there. And... Then the writer is saying, no, but what something is much better there. And 
he says, and obviously we know he's talking about Jesus. There's many ways that he's going to list here as reasons why Jesus is better and superior as our source. Uh, what are some of those things that you came up with here? Carrie. Jesus was God's messenger as well as his son. He was sent from God as our deliverer, mm -hmm. and he's our high priest. He is our high priest. It does say here, you know, Jesus, the apostle, the high priest of our confession, says he was faithful to him who appointed him. But he also goes and says that Moses was also faithful in God's house. And he's going to use this idea of the house. Okay, so what is it, what's central about this concept of the house in this section? Vernon. That's right, because the house just didn't appear out of nowhere, right? There was a, there was a purpose behind it. Uh, there was a design. Somebody over here didn't have a comment I'm missing? Uh, okay. Yeah, there was a purpose or a design to it, and, you know, the, the person who lives in the house has got to be thankful for the builder that, who put it together, right? And the writer here is saying the builder is who? It's God, Jesus, and both of them, you know, all that they did. But what, 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 uh, how was Moses described in this context? Servant. The servant. He was the servant. So he worked in the household, but he didn't design the house. He didn't build the house. He had a great purpose. He was, uh, he was a messenger and had a specific purpose for leading the people of God. Um, but it says here, for Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of the house has more honor than the house itself, where every house is built by someone. So, again, the foundation, uh, Moses had a part to play, but he was not the designer, the builder, he was the messenger. Um, Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And it says, who is, also is the house that we're referring to now? The church, us, it says, yeah, and we are his house, if indeed, now going back to our word, if indeed we do what? Hold fast. There's our perseverance, isn't it? Hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope. We're going to be the house. We're going to be taken care of by the builder and watched over by the builder. But we have to persevere. We have to hold fast. These Jewish Christians were right there teetering on giving that up, weren't they? He says, hold fast. We have to hold fast. We're, all these things we're going to see in this chapter really can apply just as much to us if we think about our lives and the things that could cause problems for us. Um, so let's go ahead and read verses 7 through 19. We're going to look at question 7 and following those verses. Brock, if you would. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, and do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my work for forty years, therefore I was provoked with that generation and said, They always go astray in their heart. They have, known, they have, they have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Take care, brothers lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened to the deceit, by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who were... For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt left, led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Okay, thank you. So... He's talking about the Israelites. And who were the Israelites 
that he's talking about here, who were they looking to as their guide at that time? Moses. Okay, so now we have the connection. We have, he's been saying Jesus is better than Moses. Now we're going to look again at the people who were following Moses and the problems that they had. And so what were the Israelites guilty of? It says they were, we, we all know how they followed Moses out of Egypt. God led them out there into the wilderness. But what were they guilty of? What started happening, Brock? Uh, they were falling astray, being rebellious in their hearts. Okay. To what God wanted them to do. Being rebellious in their hearts. Um, you know, what kind of things, just give me a few examples of things that we saw, that their attitudes and the things that they did. Yeah, Larry? Yeah. He got tired of the food. Um, yeah, it was like, this manna is getting old. I wanna, we want to try something else, you know. <laughs> yeah, Lauren. Okay, yeah, they, they said, you brought us out here to what? You brought us out here to die? You know, it's, it's hard to, I mean, I, I guess, can we identify, are we guilty of doing those things sometimes as well? I mean, we can look at them and say, why in the world would you feel this way? But do we do similar things? You know, what, what did they do immediately when Moses went up on the mountain? The golden calf. It's like, what's going on up here? We're going to, we're, Moses is up here on this mountain. Nothing's happening. We're just going to take things into our own hands. You know, they were impatient. Uh, you know, they, they tried to do things their way. They didn't have any of these characteristics that we've talked about so far when you talk about persevering through stuff. They complained. They were quick to, you know, rebel and turn away. And they just didn't have what it took a lot of times. Vernon. I think we see both today in people around us. We see people that go through terrible trials and they never turn on God. They never seem to question God. And then we see people that every little thing that happens in their life, why is God doing this to me? Mm -hmm. uh, this whole chapter to me seems to be a warning not to be like those Israelites. Don't, whatever it is, don't blame God for it. He, the bad things don't come from Him. That's right. That's right. We, we have to be careful and not be quick to blame. I mean, you look at what they saw, what they experienced, the Israelites did, coming out of Egypt. I mean, wouldn't we love to be able to see, be, a, be able to be a little bird and see all this stuff happen? How great would that be? But yet it wasn't good enough for them at times, was it? They complained. They just, they they didn't, as mentioned earlier, were they not really thankful for what they had been given. And it was easy for them just to think about what they wanted or didn't have, and they, they complained. Yes, Robert. Yeah, you talk about all the things they saw. The ten plagues were ten plagues to Egypt, but they're ten signs of wonder to the children of Israel. Each time these happened should have been a faith builder. They saw the parting of the Red Sea. All these things, and they still complained. And they weren't grateful was the big part of it. When you're not grateful, you do tend to complain. But they had a pillar of fire at night and a pillar of cloud by day constantly with them when they're in the wilderness. How could you forget all these miracles when you have this following? When you look out your tent at night, all you can see is this big pillar of fire. Mm -hmm. You didn't have to have a night light. The whole land was lit up by that fire. Yep. And, and yet they still complained. Yeah, absolutely. And because of that unbelief, you know, they, they, it says they hardened their hearts, they were rebelling. We saw that they, as we just said, ignored God's mighty works. They went astray in their hearts. And it says they had an evil heart of unbelief. Um, you know, we have to be, we can fall into the same thing. We have to be careful of that now. Uh, I just look at the way they responded in their situation in the wilderness and we're just like them in a lot of ways. We have to be willing to admit to that to ourselves. At times, we can be the same way. When we don't cling on to our faith, when we try to do things our way, we don't like things the way they come along, we're not patient. God had a plan for them, and they just had to 
be patient. He was leading them to the promised land. He was taking them to a good place. But yet they were impatient. They wanted to do things their way and they hardened their hearts to what God had done. They didn't keep their faith strong. Um, you know, I, one thing I was thinking of, when we look at our lives, it's like where we are living our lives now, aren't we in the wilderness in a, in a way? We're in the wilderness like they were. They were, were trying to get to the end, and the wilderness is in, the, in between, right? I think, why would we go through all the struggles of this life. Because as Kyle said, and looking a little farther in this uh, chapter, what were they denied because of their unbelief, their, their lack of faith, their lack of perseverance? What were they denied? What's that? The land, the promised land. And it's also talking about they were also not able to enter into their, as Kyle said, their what? Their rest. Okay. So, you know, God had an end for them. They were able to go where God had promised, given what God had promised to give them. He had it all planned out, but they just didn't take hold of it. They didn't embrace it. And so they were not able to enter the promised land. They were not able to give them their rest. And as we go farther into, into Hebrews, we're going to see how the Hebrew writer talks about the rest for us as Christians being better. We're going to explore that as well. But I, I think we have something that God has promised us. Why would we go through all the struggles of life, go through the things in wilderness, so to speak, just to enter an eternal, an eternity full of weeping and gnashing of teeth? Why would we want to do that? Rock, got a comment? It's interesting you asked that because I was just I was just trying to think of how I was going to word a comment that I wanted to make, but I think, and we see it evident with the children of Israel. It's so much of our so much of our mindset, so much of our um, character is living in the here and now, and it's I want this now. I don't want to take the time to wait for it. I don't want to. You know, I want to be good at whatever I'm going to do immediately. I don't want to. I don't want to look at how much practice and how much uh, effort I have to put into it. And the that mindset of living in the here and now causes us to forget the end goal. And so, you know, with the children of Israel, they had all these signs and wonders and stuff around them, but the fact that they were hungry and they didn't, weren't getting what they wanted to eat right then and there caused them to forget all of that around them and even to the point of even to the point of maybe saying that the situation that they were in that was absolutely horrible in their minds seemed better than what they were just because of one thing mm -hmm. and that's what we that's what we forget we we struggle to persevere because we live in the here and now right. and we don't we can't see that end goal and that's what the problem is Right. And because of that, we lose sight of the fact that there is something better awaiting us. I, I mean, I'm guilty of just this very same thing myself. But you think that if we think, and I, I'm not saying that we don't have struggles in our lives, we do. And they're hard and they're difficult and they're painful. But we have been given that promise of eternal rest and being with God through eternity. And we don't persevere sometimes the way we ought to. Or let's say we don't ever want to become a child of God. I, I look some things. I'm skipping ahead a little bit. But in, read 1 Corinthians 15. We won't have time to read all that in class. But read 1 Corinthians 15. If you, when you finish looking at that chapter... Then you would come out and say, God has put everything in place for us. All the evidence that he has laid out, the scriptures that he talks about. Um, you know, we, got, we have to avoid some things here. Uh, question nine, you know, what are three ideas presented to help us persevere spiritually? And what is likely to happen to us if we fail to persevere? Do you have three things, anybody, that you got out of that passage? Carrie. Carrie.
We need to warn each other, be faithful to the end, and trust God, or we will not enter into the place of rest. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, to exhort one another, uh, just like you said, to hold our original confidence firm to the end, to persevere. And it also mentions when he talks about in, in um, let's see, look here. Oh, verse 12, first thing he says, take care, brothers. So that means we have to be watchful. It's going to be a process. We have to be very, very cognizant of what we're trying to do. Uh, it, it's something that we can't just set to the side. Take care, brothers. Yes, Lewis. Last verse there, he said, So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. I feel these people felt like they really had belief. They thought they were steadfast in what they were doing, and they were sticking to that. But the thing they call belief, God calls unbelief. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They didn't it, have it. it. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't God's way, right? The last question on here, uh, we're not going to have time to go through these, but do, if you haven't done it, look through some of these verses. There's so many things that those verses tell us about how to persevere, to remain steadf- steadfast, and, and why, things that can encourage us and why we should remain steadfast. But I, again, as we close, I just want to go back again to 1 Corinthians 15. You know, if it talks in there, if if we look at all that God has done for us, all that God has put into place, you know, if all this is true, we're blessed beyond measure. It's, it's unbelievable what God has done and put into place for us, if this is true. If it's not true, it says, we are most of all to be pitied. What is our choice? That's where we're, we need, that, you know, the Bible a lot of times tells us not to be double-minded people, to you know, make our choice. We need to be firm in our belief of what God has done, that God is and He has His promises. And when we're on His side, if all this is true like we believe it is, then we have all kinds of things in place to help us to get there. And if, if, you, if you don't believe it's true, you know, look at the evidence. Look at the evidence. God, it's, it's overwhelming. So what is your choice? I want to encourage you, if you haven't made that a part of your life, think about those things. What is your choice? Look at the evidence of what God has in place. And He's got things there to help us persevere.